Hello and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSP. This is a Ukraine war update extra video, giving you extra nuggets and tidbits to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the war in Ukraine. A few random things to just kind of go through today. Uh, a, uh, a Ukrainian soldier here picks up the phone to tell his wife he's a bit busy during the urban combat against Russian invaders in eastern Ukraine. This is a modern war happening where social media and technology plays an incredibly important and sometimes bizarre role. Just uh, pretty insane that. Just takes a call. Yeah, I'm just uh, just in a building under mortar fire at the moment. Uh, hang on, let me just let off a few rounds here. Right, sorry about that. What's that? You want me to pick up some eggs? Yeah, sure. It's just like insane. Uh, but there you go. Uh, Russian cam. Uh, I, I don't know if you said it. Cam as cam a z six three nine six eight typhoon K is worth one point five million U S dollars somewhere in the swamps. As said, the driver unsuccessfully ended the turn and flew off the bridge. Uh, that's uh, quite a bit of bit of a loss for the Russians there, uh, in what one assumes is it w was completely unnecessary, as in it wasn't hit by opposing forces. It's just a uh, bit of a bit of a crash happening, and oof, that's that's going to hurt the budget somewhat. Um, this is yeah. Well, I'll read through it and. It's, it's, let you know what my thoughts are. A few days ago, our fighters f have noticed an unidentifiable yellow device equipped with an antenna and a flashing red beacon, which was released from an unmanned aerial vehicle at a distance of 10 meters from its intended targets. So this is uh, so a drone flies over, drops this, and you think, what's it doing dropping that? That's bizarre. I didn't have a chance to uh, take a look at it personally, but according to the information provided by the fighters on the ground, the dropped beacon is believed to be an ACR RLB 37 or 35 global fix emergency radio beacon. So this is some, imagine you were, I don't know, rock climbing or something, you fell and you have one of these, you drop it down and then you could be located, right? If you have one of these on you when you're climbing. Um, the emergency radio beacon is designed for, well, sorry, marine use, operating within the COSPAS SARSAT satellite system. While this dev device is intended to facilitate swift and efficient rescue operations, it is uh, used by Russians for precise targeting of our troops. So instead of having it on, on a uh, you know life lifeboat or something, life raft, uh, indicating where you are and that you need saving, they drop these from a drone, indicates where the target is, and that target gets hit by some kind of artillery or rocket volley, so on and so forth. Uh, the drone, I presume, is flying looking for a target uh, because if they already knew where the target was, they'd, they'd be able to do it by GPS or whatever. So the, the drone, I assume, is looking for a target, finds a target, goes, ah, that's what we need to hit. It doesn't have any munitions on it, drops that, and then the artillery uh, or long-range missiles hit, hit that or rockets hit that target themselves. Uh, the device has a certificate of approval from the Russian Maritime Register of Shipping. It appears that the emergency radio beacons are available for sale. The link in the image description is included. Uh, so there you go. Uh, this is uh, quite, I suppose, an ingenious way of doing targeted strikes on enemy forces. Well, let's move on to Igor Gherkin or Strokov or Evil Gherkin. With all recent Putin's appearances in public, here's a reminder from Gherkin on how to distinguish a real Putin from his double. Incidentally, I know I talked about how many people think that the double was in Mariupol. I actually think it was Putin. Uh, and lots of people saying, look, this guy looks different. I'm like, it doesn't really look different. But they may doubles may well be being used in, in other contexts. I just think that one was probably Putin. Uh, but it's interesting that so many people are talking about it. Well, here Gherkin... Uh, discusses this idea I'll, I'll i'll talk you through what he says for those listening um so i'll turn off the sound so he says the real vladimir vladimir uh, vladimirovich on christmas uh he says um oh, my mouse isn't working very well oh dear it's annoying 
was alone in the Kremlin church, alone. The priests were probably afraid of coming close to him. There was probably a sniper who warned he will shoot them if they came closer than 20 metres. This is a real Vladimir Vladimirovich, who, when they show him receiving ministers, he sits on one side of the table and looks at them from binoculars, and he puts uh, binocular, fake binoculars to his, imaginary binoculars to his eyes as if to look through them. Where are they? He says, this is a real one, but one who is awarding orders, hugging everyone. Uh, there are several of them, and who is making speeches. When I see an alleged Putin in the crowd, I immediately know I see a double, and no one knows what this double says. He's probably talking bollocks. I love whoever's translated this. Clearly has uh, knowledge of the English language. Uh, yeah, uh, fascinating. So even someone like this ultra-nationalist, Igor Gherkin, is saying there's clearly doubles being used. And quite often when the, Putin is seen in a crowd talking to people, that's not the real Putin because we know that's not what the real Putin does. He's afraid of getting close to people due to health issues. Coronavirus really accentuated that. Uh, where he, you had to apparently, there were spray tent tunnels you had to walk into when you're going into uh, uh, Putin's part of the the palace or whatever, uh, and you would you, literally you'd be sprayed as you went through to to make you safe from germs or viruses or whatever, and then you'd go and do your business, but it would be at, at a distance. In fact, he now still talks to many people at, at tables at a distance. Um, so if you see him in amongst amongst people shaking hands and talking to them, and especially if you don't know what is being said, he he says that is your that is your double, um, and that that's your that's not the real Putin. Anyway, interesting. I mean, I, whether that's true, I don't know, uh, but that's what certainly what what Igor Gherkin thinks of of that. Uh, fascinating interview with a ninety two year old Russian woman who talks her mind here and is bang on the money. A 92-year-old Russian woman is interviewed in the streets and gives thoughtful answers to the questions asked. Uh, let's go and see what she says. Um, and again, I'll read out. It's just it's just really quick, this. Uh, read out what she says. What do you think our country oh, has enemies? Or what do you think? Uh, does our country have enemies? Uh, says the interviewer. And she's like, hmm, I don't know. Uh, many answer with the following. Yes, it's America, the West, etc. What's your opinion about this? I think that opinion is incorrect. Then why so many people agree with that? Just because there's a lot of talk about it. And the old woman answers, We have really bad television from the viewpoint of the higher senses. It completely brainwashed our people, and that's why people give such answers. You didn't get brainwashed, then why did everyone why did everyone else? Well, not all, but many, says the interviewer. She says, I'm 92 years old. I've lived through four wars up to date. I know how to think, how to analyze. Do you really think I'm going to listen to Sol Solovyev? So he's one of the main propagandists I I've been talking about when I've been mentioning propagandists and, and the nonsense they talk. To that dame, I don't even remember her name, probably Margarita Simonian, uh, but it's not important. In the recent years, our education system has been really bad. If we started educating our children well, though these young men in Butcher and other places, it wouldn't have happened. They're savages raised by our television. That's it. Oof! I wonder whether the FSB have come knocking on the door for her, a 92-year-old, speaking her mind. And wow. So basically saying, if we had decent education where children could think critically, then you wouldn't get the adults that end up doing those, those war crimes in Butcher. We wouldn't even be at war because we wouldn't be fooled by this nonsense being delivered to us uh, through our state television by Putin. Yeah, really powerful stuff here. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, now just uh, dip into uh, a members poll that I did uh, a couple of weeks ago. I, actually, when did I do it? Four days ago. It wasn't a couple of weeks ago. It was four days ago. God, time flies when you're having fun. Or uh, time doesn't fly when you're not. I don't know. Legendary members, I asked, do you think the Ukrainians should continue to hold Bakhmut? So to my members only, I did a poll. Should the Ukrainians hold Bakhmut? 
three options. Yes, it was worth hold. It, it was. It is worth them holding still. God, I can't even spell. Yes, it is worth them holding still. No, they need to operationally withdraw now. And the third option is what the hell do I know? I'm just hanging out on YouTube. And what's interesting here is okay, this is just 22 votes from people who are members of my channel, but they are listening to what I'm listening to because I'm sharing with them what I, what I know. And even then, you got you got 27. percent So broadly, like around about a quarter say it is worth holding. Around a quarter say it's not worth holding and they should withdraw. And about half of the people saying I don't really know. I think that's an interesting split because it shows that there's no obvious right answer here. Now, the Ukrainians will have far greater information, the decision makers, far greater information than we have, accurate information about what is actually happening on those front lines. But even then, I think it's a really difficult decision and it's not very clear cut. So let's just have a read of a couple of people's opinions on this uh, on this question. Andy McGee says, Hi, Jonathan, I just became a member. To be honest, as a former infantry soldier part-time, but I was no pogue, Bakhmut looks like sheer hell. For the sake of those Ukrainians in the trenches, I hope something deal-breaking happens ASAP, even if it is a slow burn challenge. If that's not realistically forthcoming, I say bug out. Those grunts deserve it. In the meantime, I really appreciate your work uh, and the place you came uh, come at it from. Uh, so on and so forth. Um, Leah Kroll, another awesome member, says, the more I begin to understand, the more question marks I have, and it becomes clear how little we know. There are so many arguments that can be made from a distance that seem to work, but we are not fly on the wall of the commando centre. If you look on a map, Bakhmut has already largely been abandoned by the Ukrainian forces. I would say you should have left already, but yes, sometimes you also have to dig, have to do things that the enemy does not expect. There are many examples where seemingly hopeless situations have turned out for the better. I am happy and ashamed to sit by the warm stove. Uh, in other words, don't really know. I can see arguments for and against. James Cottle says, as you know, Jonathan, I'm prone to the odd stress message. Uh, there is just not enough accurate information on the losses involved. I always find myself coming back to one key fundamental fact. All of the paved tarmac roads are under fire from Russia, not just from long-range artillery fire, but from shoulder-mounted arms, etc. The side roads are dirt tracks and it's mud season. I've no idea how they are getting ammo food provisions in and no idea how they are getting the wounded out or how they will make a decent tactical withdrawal should it be required. Looking at daily maps and supply lines as a separate entity without knowing exactly what is going on on the ground, I would say they should have pulled out a while ago. Subhero says, trust in the uh, Uk Ukrainian armed forces. Armchair generals don't understand the situation on the ground. War is hell. RNH Endersby said, it's worth defending Bakhmut if there are the capability and the will. If there is a capability and a will, uh, contains a destruction. If not, then the destruction rolls across the country. So contain that destruction to Bakhmut. Otherwise, it will spread. So he would say it's worth remaining there. Vivian Collins says, It feels to me that the decision to stay in Bakhmut is a political one that needs to stay to say Bakhmut still holds. So I can only hope that there is a clever endgame that will justify the sacrifice of so many Ukrainian soldiers. It, it is a distraction to keep the Russians uh, focus on one small area while the Ukrainian army prepares for a springtime attack to the south. I just hope the explanation is a rational one. Really interesting uh, as to what you guys think uh, as to whether Ukraine should stay in Bakhmut or not. And I'm now going to go to something I cut out of my map update earlier, which is Defmon talking about what he thinks is going on in the Bakhmut and Avdivka areas and how the Ukrainians are doing what it looks like they did in the summer and that this looks to be a repeating of what they did, but with them being in actually a better position than they were last year. Anyway, over to Defmon. Defmon talks has has a little bit of a discussion about Bakhmut and Avdivka together, and I, it's worth reading. So Russians are slowly advancing in the north in but sorry in both. Bakhmut and Adivka, there have been a few reports about the Russians not having any reserves behind the lines, but I'm not sure that I believe them. 
It's something I've been wondering about. Where are their other troops? Have they got any any second echelon to bring into, into bear? The Russians have been on the offensive for about one and a half months now, and offensive operations like this wear on both equipment, personnel, and local ammunition stocks. I do not see them continuing this pace of attacks for more than another month or so. Many unknown variables. Ukraine spend the summer training and building offensive potential in their units while def defending all along the front line with minimal resources. There were multiple reports from the front lines about them not having enough resources. During that time, Ukraine accumulated equipment and trained troops while starting to strike Russian logistic targets with HIMARS. At the same time, Russians decided to move almost all their VDV units plus eastern and central military district away from the Kharkiv region. So what this is... Um, about is 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 actually skipped to talking about uh, what happened in the last summer uh, and the U ukrainians were kind of what they're doing now which is only committing uh, as little as they can while sort of training up and getting things ready uh, so in the late summer early fall ukraine managed to recapture large parts of kharkiv region as a result of attrition and low morale and severe personnel shortage for the russian uh uh, who were unable to defend the Kharkiv region. So it looks like Ukraine are doing that again. So getting the Russians to wear themselves out, spread themselves thin, only commit as enough defenders as they absolutely need to to keep on defending the territory they have. So they only make marginal losses to the Russians, uh, attriting the Russians quite significantly and then punching them with counterattacks when when they're exhausted uh, with newly trained and newly equipped troops uh, and it really does look like this is this is happening again um once that was done so this is again going back in time the ukrainians stepped up their effort to attack russian uh, g locks or ground lines of communication in the kherson region especially bridges and barges while having some initial success surprising russian logistics the russian forces quickly adapted using barges from different launch locations during this time the ukrainians attempted ground assaults in both the south and north part of kherson region with mixed results mostly unsuccessful they did have some success in the northern part which proved to be the most difficult to supply for the russian forces but even after a ukrainian breakthrough of russian lines russian armed forces managed to stop the ukrainians by sending reinforcements after just a few days at this point russian forces successfully restored g lock over the Novokokovka dam with temporary bridges uh, and i think they could have stayed in Kherson on the year out i also think they realized they would not be able to do any kind of offensive west of the dnipro and deemed it too costly to try to keep it they could instead withdraw their units reconstitute their combat potential and use them elsewhere at this point in time i'm leaning towards russia Russians made a rational decision to withdraw over time from Kherson. They did so quite successfully to continue their offensive during the winter and possibly gain the upper hand. I think this was wise and, and an important decision made by the Russians. The Russian armed forces have, during and after the withdrawal from Kherson, successfully trained their Mobix for around three months, integrated them into their regular units and created new ones. They have moved a lot of the assault units from Kherson to Bakhmut and Kremina. The Russians have a, have man, uh, Russians managed to capture Yakolivka, so this is going back in time to when they started moving on Bakhmut in early December after committing more resources to the area, air, airborne forces, VDV. At this point, the Russian forces gradually started introducing more and more personnel, which was mobilized in October. After Yakolivka was captured, the Russians had the upper hand and the Ukrainians were had exhausted a lot of their combat potential during the fall offensive. So again, the Russians were able to hit the Ukrainians back after the Ukrainians had themselves sell, culminated um uh, the Russians have gradually stepped up their efforts to attack Bakhmut since the fall of Yakolivka, and after the fall of Solodar, they really stepped it up in late January through everything at it, including the kitchen sink. What I believe we are seeing right now is kind of what we saw during the summer. Ukrainians are trying to reconstitute offensive potential while defending with minimal resources. That being said, those minimal resources are much greater now than during the summer. I have expressed disagreement with the defense of Bakhmut. This is not because I think the Ukrainians are doing the wrong thing overall, but rather I think they need to sacrifice more land for time and Russian bodies rather than sacrificing Ukrainian soldiers interesting so give up that land you need to it's all about getting time but if you give up the land you're not going to attrit the forces as much so it is give or take uh it is kind of six and one half than the other I think we will see another month or so with Russian forces having the upper hand possibly a bit slower uh towards May but sometime during June I think we might see the Ukrainians starting to operate more offensively sometime during the summer is also when most experts believe Russian forces will start running into some I real issues 
with ammunition. So I think that's a, that was worthy of mention, a good summary of what's going on. And now on to a thread I did previously that I've chopped back into this video uh, from Thomas Tyner, uh, another long thread. So I hope you enjoy this one. Anyway, let's turn now to another good old Thomas C. Tyner thread. I know you love it. So let's get into it. This one is looking at infantry anti-tank weapons. Let's get stuck in. So a look at anti-tank guided missiles, sh shoulder launched anti-tank rockets, anti-tank warheads, missile guidance systems, as well as armor countermeasures and active protection systems. You will learn a lot in these threads. Well, uh, I, I look forward to it. I'll focus on NATO, Ukrainian and Swedish versus Russian anti-tank weapons, like, for example, Javelin Spike, MRLR, Acheron, Milan, TOW 2A, Eryx, Bill, Bill 2, TOW 2B, Enlaw, Spike SR, Stugna, Corsa, Cornet, Conkers, Metis, Metis M, Faggot, RPG7, Apalas, RGW90, AT4, Panzerfaust 3, C90, Alcatan, all of the above except four, use a jet forming shaped charged warhead known as high explosive anti-tank or heat. The exceptions are the overfly top attack, Bill or Bill 2, Toe to B and Enlaw, which use a slug forming shaped charged war charge warhead known as explosively formed penetrator, EFP. An easy way to describe a heat warhead, think of a pointy ice cream cone, but the cone is made of copper. Now push the cone with the pointy end first into a block of high explosive until the cone is submerged in the explosive. Congratulations, you've just made a heat warhead. This is the warhead of an R uh, of a... All right, just make that bigger for you. This is the warhead of a BGM 71A tow. When the crush switch impacts on the target, the fuse detonates the high explosive. This creates an intense pressure shockwave that plastically deforms a copper liner into a hypersonic metal particle jet represented by the blue arrow. So there's your cone stuck into the high explosive here. And as that kind of crushes, it then shoots forward in some kind of high explosively shoots forward uh, to, to kind of do its damage. Um, for short distance... Uh, and we'll have a look at, actually, let's look at this. Um, well, I'll talk about it first. For a, for, for a short distance, the metal jet reaches speeds of 7,000 to 10,000 meters a second. Any metal armor the jet meets is plastically deformed due to intense pressure caused by the impact. In this video, a Spike SR heat warhead pierces 500 millimeters of steel armor and then a car. So let's have a look at this from the beginning. So... There we have the impact, and you can see that jet through there becomes this very thin um, sort of jet of, I don't know what you call it, some kind of well, jet of projectile that goes straight through the car afterwards. It's quite incredible. And that as well... So the, the explosion from the projectile, so the projectile is moving at, a, at quite a pace, right? But the pace of the projectile after the explosion is quicker. Do you see that's in slow motion going this speed, and then after it hits, the explosion propels uh, the, the projectile from within the, sh from within the munition, if you like, much quicker through uh, those things. Uh, Right, so to continue, once a vehicle has been pierced, splinters and spall of the hypersonic metal jet and the vehicle's armour will injure the crew uh, and detonate stored ammo. So this is what I talked about when we uh, were discussing the different types of ammunition used by tanks. Uh, they're, they're, different sh they're different rounds, they're different shells. In this case, the spalling happens when you get... In so here's, here's the tank armour. The or the vehicle armor, you've got the projectile hitting the armor from this side, it, and quite often you get an explosion, so a squash, um, hesh round, high explosive squash, squash head will squash and then explode. It doesn't necessarily go through the armor, but the exploding spalls, there's all this stuff from inside that then flies out around the interior of the 
the tank in this case and it'll do damage to people inside to stuff inside uh just wrecking all the inside so it's not necessarily it's not like a uh, projectile goes through the armor and explodes inside but actually explodes on the outside of the armor and loads of spawning inside just just destroys everything that's inside and renders the tank inoperable through damage and also by killing or, or taking out the crew uh so in this case so what it's talking about is um you know, once a vehicle has been pierced, splinters and spall of a hypersonic metal jet. So as that jet actually does go through, it's also spalling and splinters are coming out and doing damage. So it's not like you can imagine that if you had the tank and something just went straight through it, if you weren't in the way of that thing going straight through it, you just have a hole on one side and a hole on the other and it doesn't do any damage. Particularly, you could get away with like still using a tank if it just went through in one side and out the other. But as it goes through, it's causing loads of damage through spalling, splinters and all sorts. I hope that kind of explains what's going on there. Uh, at least that's how I understand it. Heat impacts are tiny but effective and deadly. Here, a heat round fired by a Carl Gustav Ricola's rifle hits a BMP-1. So let's uh, watch this in in big. Ow. That's going to hurt your ears. Sorry. And of course, all the spalling, the pressure inside as well. The entry hole is tiny. Right, so look at how small that that hole is, but then inside you get, you know, wreckage uh, and pressure as well. So, I mean, look, that's going through quite quite, and it's gone through um, metal behind it as well. So quite incredible. And you can see stuff like the uh, the lid at the top here, the hatch at the top. You know, coming up as there, there will be pressure inside and all sorts of stuff going on. You wouldn't want to be inside there, even though the hole, the hole is tiny as it goes through. Heat rounds must detonate at a certain distance from the target for the metal jet to form. But the jet travels through the air. It, uh, but as the jet travels through the air, it stretches, breaks apart and disperses quickly. Therefore, modern heat rounds have a specific detonation point to ensure maximum effectiveness about the effectiveness the penetration of heat rounds is given in charge diameter cd the first heat rounds could penetrate rolled homogeneous steel armor rha two times their cd their charge diameter initially increasing the cd was used to increase penetration as with these rpg7 rounds uh, the left one is an anti-personnel round so that would be again used against humans uh, these these against um different uh, pieces of equipment uh, with improved fuses better high explosives and new metal alloys penetration increased to seven times cds so they didn't need to be so big the, the charge diameter um i presume is the, the diameter of this and obviously the the bigger this was a more damage it would do type thing that's how i understand it i might be wrong uh, but with better explosives and new metal alloys penetration increased to seven times ds then plastic inserts were placed in the explosive to focus the shockwave for even faster metal jets modern nato heat rounds penetrate 10 times their cd uh, while the newest nato heat rounds can penetrate rha that is 12 times their cd i.e. the javelin's main warhead has a cd of about 120 millimeters so that is 12 centimeters that is uh, if you think of a goodness have i got a ruler around here no i haven't um so 12 centimeters is going to be about that uh maybe that uh, and the US gives uh, an RHA penetration of 7 CDs or 840 millimeters. So you're now talking 84 centimeters, which is going to be something like that. Uh, while the assumed real and classified penetration is at least 1,200 uh, plus millimeters of RHA. So, you know, 84 millimeters, if you tank, uh, if you've got armor that thick, you're never going to have armor that thick on a, on a, on a tank be able to move but i mean it, these things could do serious damage right uh now let's look at the slug forming shaped charge warheads of efps below graphic shows uh, the um angle of the cone is the main difference between the heat left and the efp right warheads heat forms a hypersonic metal particles jet that pierces armor while efp forms supersonic efp slugs 
uh, and reach speeds of 2,000 to 3,000 meters per second, a third the speed of heat jets. But EFP slugs travel much further without losing their destructive energy. So they, they don't hit as, uh, as fast, but they don't lose their energy uh, as they travel. A heat jet loses much of its penetration capability if it passes through air uh, for about 20 times its CD. Uh, an EFP slug can travel 1,000 times its CD before becoming ineffective. Due to their lower speed and their larger form, EFPs can penetrate much less RHA ar armor than a heat warhead. Therefore, EFPs are used against thinner armored parts of a tank, like the top, the flanks, the bottom. Therefore, the only anti-tank missiles using EFPs are overfly top tank missiles, which contain a downward pointing warhead which detonates when the missile is above the enemy vehicle. EFPs are also used to top attack sub munitions like the smart in top attack sub munitions like the smart 155 or bonus 155 and in scatterable anti tank mines like the AT2 or M70 M73 Aka Ram. So those are shells that explode and then mines come out. So what this basically means is these other types, these EFPs, like the Enlaw uses this, uh, as far as I understand, and it will fly over the top of the tank and then go downwards and explode above it, and then, but it doesn't lose its penetration capability by exploding, you know, meters above or however far above the tank. It just got, by going through the air, it doesn't lose that explosive ability, so it can still penetrate the tank, although it needs weaker armor, so it, that's why it comes to the top of the tank, because traditionally tanks have the weakest armor, you know, on top or at the back of the tank, because they're not used to being attacked from there. They're, they're used to fighting head-on. If you had heavy armor everywhere, it wouldn't be able to move, so you need to optimize your tank, so you put the heaviest armor on the front, maybe the front of the turret, the front of the... Or, or or sort of, you know, going out of that kind of angle, that's where you're going to have most of your, most of your armor. Okay? Um, I don't know how, how much of an angle that is, sort of 70 degree angle or something like that. You're going to have most of your armor at the front there, uh, and the sides and the back and the top are going to have less armor because it, it needs to move still. So anyway, uh, I digress. Let's carry on. Right, so... Uh, like, um, so left, the tantalum lined warhead of a bonus 155 that failed to detonate in Ukraine. Uh, this is when the Russians actually found out that the, the Ukrainians were definitely using these. Right, the tantalum lined warhead of an 82 mine that self-destructed in Ukraine. Uh, and there you go. Um, so EFPs use tantalum instead of the copper, as tantalum has almost twice the density of copper. Uh, and indeed, you can see what the uh, density is uh, of there, so if that's of interest to you. Higher density results in more powerful punch. This photo shows Smart 155, the slug it forms on the right, um, and uh, a block of RHA steel armor. So there's a slug. That's the kind of explosive part of the uh, the uh, the smart one five five, and that's the armor it has gone through. Uh, just to let you know that we talked a little bit about density with regard to depleted uranium armor on Abrams. They have that it's because that is denser. Depleted uranium is is a, is a denser metal than the projectiles that are fired against it, and that's why it can protect against those. Uh, some of the new rounds or many of the new rounds that are used, not the Hesh rounds, but other types of rounds, the AFPDS, or, or no, I've got the letters in the wrong order there. Um, they are, they become so dense, uh, they're really dense and can just go through uh, many, many armors like knife through butter, basically. So you need something that's denser than the projectile to protect, protect against those projectiles. Um, uh, so, and a block of, of RHA steel armor that the slug pierced. Once the armor is pierced, high temperature and high velocity armor and slug fragments will destroy everything inside the arm, an armored vehicle. Modern EFP warheads like the Smart 155 above and a bonus 155 in this video use specifically designed fuses to produce long rods or stretched slugs, which can penetrate much more armor. Well, let's have a look at this then. Um, so this is one of these being used. 
and uh, I'm sure it's going to be something there. You can see it come down, and it explodes above. So these are these are shot from howitzers as far as I understand them, but they work a bit like the end laws, and they they calculate where the uh, vehicle is and then explode above it, and then the 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 slug then goes down through the top of the vehicle. So I hope you could see that on the video there. Um, so he says, I'll explain later how overfly top attack missiles know when to detonate their warheads. For now, enjoy the American TOW-2B missile destroying a Russian tank with its two EFP warheads. So let's have a look at that again in big. So you can see it uh, detonate above initially before utterly destroying that tank. And, and a good bit of turret tossing. And it, it was a good couple of meters above the tank. Um, so it didn't hit the tank itself. It explodes above the tank. And then the slug does the rest uh, of the job or or rod or whatever it is. So anyway, that, that that's a, a good uh, visualization there. Fun fact, each Bradley receives each Bradley Ukraine receives comes with a double tow launcher and tows have more range than a Russian tank can fire there's very little chance of survival for the already few remaining Russian tanks uh, so let's have a look at uh, these Bradleys so here you have these tows there um, I have a feeling these have lines that you, these are, have to have line of sight so they uh, they have these lines that go out after them I may be wrong I'm sure toes do. Um, and they have to have, yeah, it's not fire and forget. So basically you can't fire them and then drive off. You need to still be kind of looking at the target, but still longer range than, than the Russians have. So very useful for the Ukrainians there. Now you know all about anti-tank warheads. I mean, I hope you know a bit more. There's a lot of confusing stuff in there. But to fully understand infantry anti-tank warfare, we also must look at explosive reactive armor, spaced armor, non-explosive reactive armor, tandem warheads, missile guidance, etc. I'll do threads about those soon. Um, and in fact, he's got part two up, but I'll leave that for another one. Um, uh, that gives you some indication of how these uh, warheads might work uh, as they... Uh, take out bits of uh, equipment like tanks, BMPs, and whatnot, which BMPs are the Russian for infantry fighting vehicles, which are vehicles that can carry uh, humans, but also have like a gun on top. Uh, just to explain in case you don't know what an IFV is. Um, APCs are armored personnel carriers. That are vehicles that carry people that don't necessarily have these big guns on top uh, that can do uh, quite a bit of damage. So uh, thank you, Thomas C. Tyner. And just to finish off today's extra video, let's do something a little bit different. This is uh, track surfing. I guess that when you're in a war, sometimes you need a bit of a release. And it's better to have a release like this that is positive and fun rather than a dark release. Uh, so here, some track surfing. I'm going to have to cut the music, obviously, for copyright reasons. But that would be a pretty cool choice of tune. These guys are having some fun. And it looks like the tank's going in reverse. Seems like that's a quicker reverse than, what's it, T-72s have, isn't it a four, four mile an hour reverse or something? Yeah, pretty slow. But anyway, uh, that's uh, good fun to be had by some soldiers in some, no doubt, rare downtime. Well, I say rare downtime. There is the idea that war is, uh, you know, Nothing happens for a very long time, and then everything happens all at once. Uh, many claims are actually there's a war is punctuated boredom. There's a lot of hanging around, not doing anything, and then suddenly you know, there's fierce fighting that takes place. Uh, and that might take place for a long time, or it might just be short bursts, and then a lot of nothing again. Um, when you've seen these areas maybe around Abdivka before the offensive that's taking place now, the, Abdivka is a place that hasn't changed for an awful long time in terms of territory. And you had a lot of people just sitting in in bunkers and trenches, occasionally, you know, swapping some fire, but but not doing a lot. So you get different experiences of war. But I do like that that maxim: nothing happens until everything happens all at once. 
Anyway, thank you for watching. That is uh, another video for you. If you uh, have the wherewithal and the desire, you can grab some merchandise. If you pop along to uasupporter.com forward slash ATP, that forward slash ATP is super important, then you can get yourself all sorts of different merchandise that shows your support for Ukraine, whilst also a little bit of commission goes to my um, my channel. So that's something you can choose to do if your internet works a little bit better than mine, if your browser isn't like working over time with like 50,000 tabs working in different places. Uh, but, you know, there you go. That would be fantastic, uh, but only if you have the wherewithal and desire to do so. Speak soon.